Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's mentoring hour. We'll pray and get started. I want to request uh, one of us on the call to please go ahead and lead in prayer, after which we will take some time to address questions uh, that may be raised in today's session. So, um, Brother Sanjay, would you please be able to lead us in prayer today? Yes, Pastor. Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for this time of mentoring. We just pray, Father, that uh, your Holy Spirit will minister to us and lead us through this session, Father. We we also pray that whatever we learn, we'll be able to apply the same in our lives and be a blessing to others, Lord. We pray for a, a blessing upon our entire faculty and all the students here attending this session. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great joy to welcome uh, all our students and faculty in these sessions every week. Um, as we all know, the Mentoring Our Sessions are interactive sessions where uh, students can put forth questions from whatever they are learning. We have 48 um, subjects, courses that we run through three years. Uh, so maybe questions from what we are learning or if there are questions uh, from uh, any other subject that uh, you know you really wanted to learn more about, uh, this is a, a time to ask those questions. Uh, our faculty is on this call, and um, our faculty are on this call, and you know we'll do our best to address those questions. Uh, and uh, first of all, hope that uh, each one of you is enjoying your uh, time here at APC Bible College learning, uh, and I hope it's been an enriching experience. Uh, so. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. I know every week we generally have a subject that we focus on and uh, the questions are invited uh, in relate relation to that particular topic. But uh, uh, today we are making this a general session where uh, uh, questions can be asked from you know anywhere, uh, any, any kind of questions pertaining to Christian life, pertaining to Christian ministry. So the time is open. For all of us, uh, please feel free. You can ask your questions either on chat or uh, you could please unmute and uh, ask the questions. Even as we wait for uh, questions, uh, we could take some time to just share, uh, you know, from uh, what we are learning, or maybe uh, the subject that uh, you know is is really impacting you in this season. So, uh, if there's any particular, okay, uh, I think Pratt has a question. Pratt, yeah, could you please unmute and ask the question? Okay, good morning, Pastor. Good morning. I have a question. Um, yes. Reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verse, um, verse 11, Pastor, where the Bible says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Um, this, these two um, ministry ministry gifts, that the pastor and the teacher, I don't, is there any difference between a pastor and a teacher or are they, is it like pastor and teacher, are, are they two in one, is it two in one gift or they are separate entities? Like, do they, are they any, is there any difference between the calling of a pastor and the calling of a teacher? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prat. Thank you for that question. So um, Prat is asking us if there is any difference between the office of a uh, uh, or the calling of a teacher and a pastor. So just like to open this question out to our faculty on the call. Um, uh, Prad, I'll just share some thoughts. Uh, uh, to put it very 
in, in a very simple way. A pastor has to be a teacher, but a teacher doesn't need to be a pastor. So a teacher is a person who's really teaching the word, you know, and uh, explaining the word. Uh, he, he doesn't need to pastor people. So he's just teaching the word to people. So typically these would be people who are moving from place to place. They're teaching, having a teaching ministry. They're teaching God's word. They don't need to pastor. Whereas a pastor is a shepherd. He's usually staying among a congregation. He's caring for the people. Uh, and he's, he's caring for them holistically. That means for all in all areas of their spiritual growth and life and so on. But he also has to be a good teacher. You know, and you find this in First Timothy chapter 3, where Paul says, uh, verses 1 to 8, where Paul says, if anyone wants to be a bishop, that is a spiritual overseer, and he gives all these things. And one of the things is he should be apt to teach. So part of it, part of that spiritual overseer role is he has to be able to teach the word. So uh, you, we can sum it up like that. A pastor has to be a teacher, but a teacher doesn't have to be a pastor. So the pastoral responsibility includes a lot of other things. Right? There, there's a lot of uh, caring for the people, a lot of administration, organization, which a person who's a teacher doesn't have those responsibilities. They just teach the word. They go from place to place. Now, they may have a big teaching ministry in, in which sense then that becomes an organization and they may have lots of staff working and so on. So example, if you want to think about this, uh, and I'm just picking some names as illustrations. You may think about Joyce Meyer. Uh, she's a teacher. She's not a pastor. She teaches. She has conferences. She writes books. She has a big organization, maybe several hundred people, but she's a teacher. Whereas you can look at somebody else, uh, you know, who is a pastor teacher, meaning they're pastoring a church. They have a congregation, but they're also good teachers of the world. Hope that helps, Brian. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, thank you, Pastor Ashish. And thank you, Platt, for that question. Uh, we'll take up uh, Deeksha's question here in the chat. And in the meantime, I would like to encourage um, the others of us who do have questions to please go ahead. You may uh, kindly post it in the chat, and we will keep taking up the questions one by one. So Deeksha says, Pastor, I want to ask one question. In Mark uh, 11, verse 13 and 14, why Jesus cursed the fig tree, even though it was not the season for figs? So why did Jesus curse the fig tree, even though it was not the season for figs? So I, for one, I can think of the fact that, I mean, he was, of course, teaching a lesson about faith and the power of uh, the authority that words carried. Uh, but yes, why did he curse the fig tree when it wasn't the season for figs? So if any of our faculty would like to take that up, I'd just like to open it up. Um, hi, Pastor Nancy. Yeah, hi, hi, Pastor Nancy. Uh, add, so yeah. Uh, uh, this particular fig tree, uh, so it it um, uh, it bears fruits twice a year, uh, so to speak, and so once in its actual season, and then then when it end again during the month of March, I had to go back and study after the geography session on some of the trees, and so I learned that a fig tree also, you know, when they begin to blossom in uh, March, month of March, um, along with the leaves, they also produce small figs, so to speak, and uh, so. Although here in this context, Jesus is talking to the fig tree, but we know also in the Bible that uh, from in Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Luke, uh, Hosea, that Israel is uh, uh, the nation of Israel, or people of Israel are uh, like a symbol, a symbol for a fig tree. And so uh, Jesus, in a way, is talking to the people of Israel and saying, uh, you ought to bear fruit in uh, every season. Um, so, I, um, and that's, I think, my is my understanding of from you know um, that he is he is talking to the tree, but then he is also addressing um, the nation of Israel in a way to bear fruit at every season, uh, so to speak. That's my understanding of it best. 
thank you. Thank you, Pastor Roshan, for sharing uh, that additional insight. If there, there is any, any other insight, I want to request the faculty to please go ahead and share. Why curse the fig tree when it's not the season for figs? Uh, Pastor Ashish, uh, would you have any thoughts on this, please? Uh, I mean, I disagree. You know, with um, the first part of what Roshan said, which is uh, essentially just to teach, illustrate to his disciples, uh, which was the main message he was getting sure. across was about faith and how the exercise was. Yeah. So he gave an illustration and then he gave the lesson, which is. Yes, how you exercise today. Sure, sure, Pastor. Thank you so much. And Diksha, uh, hope uh, you're you're happy with that answer. Hope your question is addressed. As thank you, thank you for confirming. Uh, so, if there are any questions, any burning questions? Now's the time to put it forward. Okay, um, so Pratt has posted in the chat section, he says, Pastor, is it possible for one to have a dream and confirmation concerning a particular sister in church whom he is considering for marriage, but the sister gets married to um, another person? Uh, okay, thank you, Pratt, for that question. Uh, want to request Pastor Jay Kumar. Uh, Pastor Jay Kumar, would you please be able to address Pratt's question here? Um, sure, Nancy. Sorry. Sorry. Let me take. Yeah. Um, just wanted to um, share that. Um, yeah. I think God speaks. God uh, directs. And um, here it is. Uh, a life partner, a spouse, and um, let's say God is giving a dream, um, but ultimately it is uh, the will of the individual. You know, ultimately we choose, we decide, um, we make that choice. So yes, it's not automatic because God gives, maybe suggests. Okay, um, uh, of course we are just assuming that is a real, authentic case. Or where God is, um, you know, in in the dream, he's speaking and he's suggesting, okay, this this could be a person or this is the person. But then uh, it involves the will of the person as well, you know. So the other person also has to be willing in order to uh, willing to you know, decide and choose and pray and so on. So yes, it is possible whether the other person could, you know, make a choice uh, different. From whatever God is showing. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for uh, uh, answering Pratt's question. Pratt, uh, is that all right, or do you have any follow-up questions to that? No, I'm okay with that, Pastor. You're Thank okay you. with that. Okay. Thank you. So while we wait for uh, more questions on this call. I just thought we can take some time to uh, share what we are learning. This is something that the Lord is ministering to our hearts in this season. Uh, then you can also please feel free to share that. Okay, again, I think I um, uh, we will ask uh, Sam Matthews. Sam, is there anything that you know you're learning in this season? It could be uh, from you know the subjects that we have here at Bible College, but or it could be outside. That's fine. But uh, please feel free to share. Uh, 
uh, okay, it could be on the spot, but <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, no, I've just been um, listening to a lot of podcasts on leadership. Um, so, just been kind of uh, reading and listening to what an effective leader looks like uh, from dif- different aspects. So, uh, yeah, and also looking at biblical examples of different leaders through different times and how they were leading people um, and just trying to make that my own um, in my own context. So that's really been very encouraging and also realizing that no leader is perfect. So you can take the pressure off. Um, yeah, that's, that's just something that I've been kind of uh, thinking about a lot lately. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for sharing, even though it was so sudden, you know, the, that question posed to you. Uh, but uh, yeah, so nice to hear that you're reading more about leadership. That's wonderful. So we'll just wait uh, for a moment for a question or two. Yes, yes, uh, Brother Sanjay, please go ahead. Pastor, this is a, a bit of a controversial question which I'm about to ask. So on April 8th, there's a big event. Like we've all heard about a, a major eclipse taking place, a solar eclipse taking place over the United States. And there's a lot of you know ambiguity about it. You know, some people are saying it's, it's possibly a day of the rapture. Some people are saying those don't believe in the rapture, saying it's possibly it's a major event is gonna take place on Earth. So I mean, I, I just any, would anyone like to throw some light on it? I mean, I, I did dig into it a little bit, but I didn't go too deep into this matter. Is it significant to us as Christians? That's that's a question I wanted to ask. Mm, thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Sanjay. So uh, Sanjay is asking um, if the solar eclipse that is coming up uh, is significant, like in a spiritual sense, uh, to a believer, to Christians. And I just want to open out this question to our faculty. I honestly just found out about it from Sanjay just now. So. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so Sanjay, just check very briefly. Yeah. So, you know, um, there are natural events that keep on happening right and there are things in the bible for example uh, it says the sun will be darkened the moon will be turned to blood red now that's language used in scripture joel chapter 2 acts 2 revelation 8 revelation you know so it's there now what usually happens, especially in the Christian church, and I'm just speaking in general terms, that something is happening like this, um, like a solar eclipse, or uh, in in 2019, I think there was the uh, the blood moons, you know, so the moon would appear as blood red. Um, so when these things happen, or I think even in 2019, there was an alignment of the constellations. Uh, with uh, with uh, the stars coming in the shape of a woman giving birth to a man child, which kind of you know in Revelation twelve it talks about a woman with a man child, the sun, the moon, the stars. So what we have observed is that every time something like this happens, there's a certain part of the church, and not from the entire church. The certain part they all get excited. They say it is another uh, apocalyptic event happening. And then this event comes and goes, and life goes on. And we've seen it happen many times. 
And so this solar eclipse is just one other thing like that, where there's always this excitement in a certain part of the church, a certain segment of the church. Oh, this is another apocalyptic event. The sun is actually, and it, it, the, 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 the eclipse is passing through now the town of Nineveh and uh, all of these things that create all these stories, there's so much hype. And some Christian authors will write books about blood moons, have best-selling books coming up, all of these things, they'll make a lot of money. And what we've seen time and time again is this comes and goes. So uh, are these things happening? Yeah, it is natural cosmic events. Uh, are these fulfillment of Bible prophecy as we talked about in Joel 2, Acts 2, uh, Revelation 8, Revelation 12? No. Why? Because these Bible prophecies have a context. Joel 2 is fulfilled in Revelation 8, which is happening during the Great Tribulation. So the question we have to ask is, are we in the Great Tribulation? The answer is no. So it's not the fulfillment of that prophecy, right? Because there's a context to what Joel spoke about, what the book of Revelation talks about. Revelation talks about it in twice, uh, about the sun being dark and the moon turn being turned to blood red, two judgments, two occasions. But when is it happening? During the Great Tribulation, not outside of it. Or Revelation 12, what is that? It's not really talking about cosmic events. It's a picture of uh, Israel, the sun, the moon, the seven, uh, 12 stars. It's a picture of Israel. It's not talking about cosmic events. So there's, there's a correct interpretation of Bible prophecy. You have to look at the context. You have to look at the very imagery. But when people take this out of context, they you know create a lot of hype. There's a lot of in, excitement in certain segments of the church. What what we have seen is things come and go. Life goes on as normal. So that's what I would say concerning this solar eclipse about to happen. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Uh, Brother Sanjay, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much, Pastor. A lot, lot of clarity in this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have no questions uh, in the chat here. Oh, quite a lot of questions, actually. So we'll just uh, go to each one. Uh, Avdesh Kumar asks, can non-baptized people take Lord's Supper in case uh, he was unable to take baptism due to some problem, but he uh, repented and accepted Jesus as his savior. So can people who are not baptized partake of the Holy Communion? Uh, Pastor Jaykumar, would you please be able to address Avdesh's question? I'm sure, I'm sure, Nancy. So, um, so we see these two sacraments in the Word of God in the New Testament Church about water baptism and the Holy Communion. Um, but nowhere do we see um, you know, uh, explicit instruction that one has to be um, baptized in water in order to take part in the in communion. Yes, in the New Testament Church, you know, it was one package in the sense people believed they received the Lord, and as a demonstration of the inward change, they would go ahead and be baptized to declare that they belong to Jesus, dead to sin, alive to God, and so on. So it was one package, and we know that you know over a period of time, the you know the it got kind of uh, you know uh, kind of separated as two separate events, but. Um, but we know that um, you know there's nothing to prevent us from taking a part in communion, which is again uh, a declaration of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. So the Bible gives us the instruction that we need to examine that we are examine ourselves and see if we are in the faith. And then, uh, if we are in the Lord, in the faith, we are acknowledging, or we are doing it in a trivial manner, you know, in a in a manner that not. Uh, not re revering what God has done. So that is the only instruction that we have, but nowhere do we see an explicit instruction that we need to be uh, water baptized. But yes, we need to teach the church that water baptism is something that is an instruction from the Lord. It is for all believers to obey and walk in. And uh, and when we, when we submit to that instruction, we walk in greater authority and experience the power of um, you know, uh, of obeying and submitting to the word, and all that is true. But um, yeah, this aspect of um, um, you know, you have to be water baptized in order to take part in baptism. Uh, we don't see in uh, scripture. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, 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 Brother Abdesh, I hope this addresses your uh, question. Please let us know if uh, it's all right or if you have any follow up questions to that. Request you to. Uh, yes, sister. Actually, uh, yes. Uh, we we ah. we don't found any connection, any connection, and Lord Supper. There is no any connection. The first uh, Lord Supper, Jesus uh, uh, give give to the disciples. No? So Romans six four is saying that the baptism is like. Yeah. when we come out from the water we alive with him so the first disciple 12 disciple uh, they took lord's supper but they don't baptize like that only so that is why I asked. okay um uh, about the lord's supper and baptism okay uh, uh brother Abdish, but your question is addressed right Sorry. Uh, so the answer to the question, you've you've heard that. Is that okay? Yeah, yes, your yes. answer is yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Your okay, your answer sure. is correct. Uh, All but, right. Uh, it was not uh, It was not clear. Can take or not? <laughs> okay. So, uh, Pass is saying that uh, one who is the, yes. the person the person is accepting uh, accepting uh, the Jesus as his savior, and he also believes everything he want to take baptism but there is some problem to take baptism like uh, there is no water there is some persecution sure. so in yes. case can he uh can he participate the lord's supper this yes. was my question correct so uh brother Avdish, as pastor jay kumar uh, answered it he said yes a person who's not baptized you, because of some particular reason can take communion so thank you thank you so much um Sure. So we'll move on to the next question here uh, from Shiv Kumar S. It says, Pastor, a believer is not succeeding in any of the job. Wherever he joins, he will have one or the other problem and end up leaving that job. Why is it and how to go forward? Pastor Roshan, uh, any thoughts on this? Um, um really uh, i'm not sure how to answer the question pastor Nathan. i'm sorry okay, uh, fine. No problem. yeah yeah sure no problem thank you uh, pastor Roshan. i'll just open it out to our other faculty here so believer is not succeeding in any job uh, yes i'll just have a few thoughts and then uh, i'm sure others will have something to say um one is is that we must be confident that God wants us to be successful. Right? Uh, God is for us to be successful. Uh, someone says that, you know, as his people, as we uh, meditate in his word and follow him, we will be fruitful. Right? We will bring forth our fruit in its season. So God's will is for us to be successful. Psalm 35, 27, now let them shout for joy that favor my righteous cause. Uh, 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 the Lord uh, delights in the prosperity or in the success of his servant. So God delights in our prosperity, in our success. So that we are confident of that. So the, 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 then, then the question is, why is somebody not being successful? Uh, it could be many reasons, and so we need to look at the reasons. From from a spiritual perspective, we know God wants us to be fruitful and successful. The reasons could be many, and we need to examine that, right? One could be maybe the person needs to improve their skills, learn some skills. Maybe the person needs to find the right kind of job. Maybe they're in a job where it's they're not really meant to be there. Right? So that's why they're not really being... You know, seeing good outcomes, so they, they need to be in the right place. Sometimes it could be an attitude problem, you know, the, uh, how they work. Sometimes it could be a people relational problem, uh, how they re relate to other people. 
uh, because uh, to be successful in, in a job, in a role, some roles, they require that you need to work with others. And so maybe their relational skills are not great. They need to learn how to do that. So uh, the answer to your question is, uh, we need to find out. Sorry, first, we need to be convinced. God wants the person to be fruitful, successful, no doubt. Second, find out where are the gaps, where are they lacking, and address those. And if you put the right person, you put the person in the right place with God's help and them doing their part, they will definitely be successful. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for uh, sh sharing your thoughts regarding Shiv Kumar's question. Uh, Shiv Kumar, uh, did that address your question completely? Please let us know. OK, he says, thank you, Pastor. We'll take up the questions in the chat first. And we saw a hand raised. So if you have sufficient time, we will uh, you know, come back to you. Uh, the next question here in the chat is from Prince. He says, good morning. In the Old Testament, the priest and the people accepted that the lamb uh, as an offering that cleanses them and they sacrificed it. But we know Jesus was rejected, right? Then how can he be the sacrifice or offering that cleanses us? So uh, Prince's question is, in the Old Testament, the offering of a lamb was people accepted that lamb and then you know the offering was made and uh, so there's acceptance there but we know that jesus was rejected uh, so how can he be the sacrifice or offering that cleanses us Yeah, I think the response is very simple. First, God has accepted Christ's offering. Isaiah 53, verse 12. He shall see the suffering of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. So first, God has accepted this offering. Second, for us to be cleansed, God is inviting each one of us to accept. So the answer is, we have to accept, each one of us, that I receive personally what Jesus did on the cross. Then when we accept, we experience the cleansing. So even in the New Testament, we have to accept, then we will experience the cleansing. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Prince, I hope it has addressed your question. Please let us know if you have any follow-up questions to that. All right, I think we'll just move forward with the uh, the next question, and Prince, if you have anything more to ask, you can always let us know. Uh, going to Lucy Samuel, she says, during my course at APC, I've been strengthened in my spiritual life, knowing more uh, of God, who is all powerful, experiencing conviction to correct myself, learning scriptures to understand my positional truth in heavenly places, to speak with authority, and also made an effort to share for 30 minutes on praise and worship, which was uh, an impossible act in my life. Uh, thank you for sharing, Lucy. We truly rejoice with you in what God is doing in your life. Uh, glad to know that you are being enriched uh, in every way, and also that you had this opportunity to, to share the word of God. Uh, God bless you. Uh, We'll go on to Pratt's question in the chat here. He says, Pastor, could you please throw some light between the church and the kingdom? The church and the kingdom. I think I'll go ahead and uh, request Pastor Jai Kumar to please answer Pratt's question. Um, sure, Nancy. 
Thank you. So, um, the church and the kingdom, well, we know by definition that church is the ecclesia, the gathering uh, of the of the people sent out ones, ga people gathering together for a purpose. And we also know that the, the church, as we see it, the local church is an expression of the of the ministry of the authority um, of Christ in a particular place. And we know that, that we also have a local church and the global church. Um, so it is the people who are the uh, uh, who are the hands and feet and and carrying the anointing and the power of the Lord and expressing the love and expressing that and ministering uh, in that place um, as as the Lord would. So and of course there are many other aspects of the church being the you know the living stones put together to offer up a spiritual sacrifice and so on. Um, and uh, kingdom by definition is the domain of the king, the rule and reign of the king well um so we we know that uh, when we say uh, you know lord your kingdom come your will be done we're talking about the the rule and reign uh, of of the king uh, of the law of god uh, individually in our lives and also corporately uh, together as a church um so by definition uh, well this is something that we see um also um, we know that um, we, uh, you know, as part of the local church, we we know that God has a specific plan and purpose and vision for that body of believers. Um, and at the same time, we also need to understand that, yes, there are different local churches, but we are also, um, you know, part of the kingdom of God. That all these local churches are part of the kingdom uh, of God. So we, as we've been learning, we've been, we need to have that kingdom mindset and kingdom values um, in order to bring forth kingdom purposes. Um, yeah, I hope that helps, um, Brad. Thank, Thank you, Pastor Jayakumar. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Jay Kumar. Thank you, Brad. Brad, I think uh, Pastor Jay Kumar has addressed the connected questions as well. I know I didn't read it out, but. Correct, uh, yeah. Yes. So yeah. for for the sake of all of us, I'll just quickly read out uh, those connected uh, portions. Um, so Pratt had written, firstly, he had asked through some light uh, about church and the kingdom. Then he said, there are so many churches and Christian ministries with various teachings and revelations, especially in Africa. How can one live a life rooted uh, in the kingdom of God? And uh, Pastor Jay Kumar has addressed that for us. Uh, I'll now uh, request... Uh, Asapu, I saw your hand raised. Could you please go ahead and ask your question? Then we'll come back to the others who have posted and who also want to ask. Uh, can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, we can uh, hear you. It's a follow-up question from the previous question that I have asked. OK, yes. So uh, like uh, I have like the question is like if in the Old Testament, we see is the priest who takes the lamb and give uh, make a sacrifice. But uh, but if we see, but uh, Jesus was not sacrificed, but uh, priests and all uh, priests and uh, Pharisees they rejected and gave him to the Romans to be crucified. So it's like a murder. So will it? How come it can come into the category of? A sacrifice because uh, it's not the priests who are uh, doing it right so uh, that's my question all right yeah so, yes, um, so just quick answer uh, Hebrews the book of Hebrews chapters 8 9 10 uh, bring this out actually from chapter 7 itself the so in the book of Hebrews we see that Jesus is the high priest. And Jesus takes his own blood into the very presence of God, into the tabernacle. So in Christ's death, his physical death, yes, when you look at what happened, seems like a murder. The Romans nailed him to the cross. But on the spiritual side, the high priest, the great high priest, Jesus, took his blood, the blood of the spotless Lamb of God, and offered it before the throne of the Father. Right? Hebrews 9, 12 to 14. 
he entered in the holiest with his own blood, not with, not with the blood of lambs, bulls, and goats, but with his own blood, he entered into the holy place. So it's Jesus is the perfect. What we see in the tabernacle is only a copy. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, and Prince, I hope that it addresses your question. Thank you. Thank you for confirming. We'll go back to the chat here. And uh, Badav Desh writes, thanks, Herman, to uh, uh, answer the question. Uh, I like APC believe and uh, doctrines and like to read the books written by you. It's very useful for my ministry. Thank you for sharing with Avdesh. And uh, uh, Rupa has a scripture here. I think it's connected to what we had spoken about the fig tree earlier. She says, I found the scripture from Hosea 9, 10 says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits of the fig tree in its first season. Um, so, uh, uh, Sarupa, I'm thinking that uh, this is connected, right, to the earlier discussion that we had. Uh, but I'll right now come to Jeffina's uh, question. And she says, Pastor, if a person takes part in the communion in an unworthy manner, is it a sin? We see a reference to that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 to 29, to not partake of the Holy Communion in an unworthy manner. So if one does so, is that a sin? That's Jeffina's question. I think I uh, will request Pastor Ashish to kindly address this question, Pastor. Um, yeah, the Bible does say that, um, you know, you read First Corinthians 11, we have to judge ourselves, so we will not be judged. And if you don't, you will be condemned. And uh, so the answer to the question is yes, it is sin. That's why there are instructions on how to do it. And uh, uh, we should not do it. And the consequence, one of the things that Paul says there is uh, that they become sick, they die early. Uh, these are the things that Paul mentions right there because of not participating in a worthy manner, which, which would have brought the blessing of good health and long life. Uh, because they were doing it unworthily, they were seeing the results of it, which was sickness and early death. So the answer to your question is yes, and that's why there is instruction on how to do it right. Thank you, Pastor. And uh, Jeffina, hope that uh, answers your question. Please let us know. Uh, uh, good morning, Pastor. You yes, good morning. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. So what do we mean exactly when we uh, tell it's a unworthy manner? We know in that context uh, that they were all uh, coming for the sake of food just to eat and all this. But in our uh, time and in, in this generation, what do we exactly mean uh, as an unworthy manner? Uh, I'm asking this because uh, I saw once uh, someone... Uh, like in a teenage, a, a t t teenage girl who took uh, the communion and uh, someone pointed out to her what she has been doing throughout the week. And uh, she said, uh, like, you are not taking it in a worthy manner. You are not respecting, uh, you are not following Christ in your life and you are still taking part in the uh, Lord's table. So exactly what do we mean when we say as an uh, unworthy manner, uh, how do we examine an, ourselves whether we are taking it in a worthy manner or in an unworthy manner? Thank you, Jeffina. Thank you for that question. I'll, okay, yes, Pastor, please go. Yeah, so Jeffina, uh, the same passage tells us how to take it in a worthy manner. First, he says, examine yourself. So very simple. I say, Lord, uh, I'm judging myself, right? The context there. If you judge ourselves, we will not be judged. So to examine myself means I judge myself. So being honest about uh, if there's any sin, I confess. If I'm not being living right, I confess. Now, it's not to self-condemn, but it is to be honest with God. 
So that's the first one. Examine yourself or judge yourself. Second, it says discern the Lord's body. To discern the Lord's body means understand what Jesus did for us through his body on the tree. I say, Lord, I understand. I discern. I see. Discern is seeing, understanding, perceiving. I discern. I understand that you bore my sins. That's why I'm forgiven. So when I examine myself, if I find that I've committed 10,000 sins last week, it doesn't matter. Because the next step is, I understand that Jesus paid for all those 10,000 sins. I for, I'm forgiven. I receive the cleansing. And I take part. So just because I have a 10,000 sins last week doesn't mean I should not take part. I just follow these two simple steps. I examine. I discern. discern. Part of discerning is I receive cleansing from my 10,000 sins. And then I'm worthy, fit to take part. And for somebody to point finger at someone else and say, you are not fit, that's wrong. Because in Paul's instruction, he's not saying, examine your neighbor. He's saying, examine yourself. He's not saying, judge your neighbor. He's saying, judge yourself. So they're not following the instructions. In fact, I would say the person who is pointing out to the other person saying, you're not fit to take, that person is not following instructions. The instructions are, examine and judge yourself. Two simple instructions. Second, discern the Lord's body. Understand what he finished for us on the cross and receive it. Then partake. So I receive it by faith. Then when I eat the bread and drink the cup, I am acting out my reception when I discern the Lord's body. It's very simple. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Jafina, I hope that has answered your question. Thank you. Thank you for confirming. Um, and as Roshan, connected to what we are discussing right now, uh, has mentioned that uh, the House of God, ABC publication, carries a chapter on the sacraments, chapter 19. That is also something you uh, might want to refer to. Uh, there are three more questions. Uh, I am not too sure if we can. Uh, you know, accommodate them on this call. So we'll address Lucy's question briefly. And uh, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Kofi and uh, Rupa or uh, Rupus, we will take up your questions in the next mentoring hour. So Lucy is asking, how do I have a check on meditating God's word in daily life, which I'm not able to practice regularly? So a few thoughts, uh, Lucy. Firstly, to set aside time to do it. Because if, if that is important uh, to us, then we need to determine, we need to make up our minds and set aside time to do it. And also, uh, you know, have the Bible and some other helpful resources that can help us meditate uh, on God's word. In addition to this, um, you know, thanks to technology uh, these days, we can listen to, to God's word uh, even as we are traveling. So there are there are ample resources that we can access because of technology to also uh, keep doing that you know throughout the day uh, and that would uh, help us to uh, meditate on god's word because meditation of god's what what is it you know as uh, we know that greek word um, uh, it simply means to to mutter to to repeat to yourself to to let that word um, soak into us and uh, the more we uh, expose ourselves to that word and spend time in the word we will be able to uh, you know uh, take it in and also see the fruit uh, of the power of that word so i hope that uh, helps you please let us know and uh, with this we will wrap up this morning's mentoring hour session um, we'll take up kofi and rupus's question in the next mentoring hour uh, so as we conclude uh, let's wrap up with the word of prayer and i want to request uh, one of us on the call to please go ahead and pray please heavenly father we thank you for this hour of mentoring lord we thank you for all the questions and the answers father for the light which you've shed we thank you father for even our instructors thank you for the pastors lord we ask that you continue to grant more grace and wisdom 
Father, we give you all the honor and all the glory. We ask all this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pratt. Thank you, everyone, all faculty and students. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Bye for now.